transformation of power. This little book challenged me to discover my one word. That one word is going gonna, is gonna to be used to bring me laser beam, beam clarity and focus for the next 12 months in my life. <clears throat> my challenge for you today, and for everyone here, everyone who's listening by way of video, to find your one word. There's a simple three-step process. They showed it to you on the video. And that is, one, to prepare your heart by looking in. Then two, discover your word by looking up. And three, live your word by looking out. We're going to look at each one of these today. <clears throat> prepare your heart by looking in. In 2 Chronicles 12, 14, we read these words. And he did evil because he prepared not his heart <clears throat> to seek the Lord. <coughs> Preparation is extremely important if we are going to achieve the full potential that God has given us when he created us. John Wooden is one of the greatest coaches who ever lived. He led the UCLA basketball team to 13 national championships. I believe eight of those were in a row. He was the only person inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame as both a player and a coach. <clears throat> His favorite phrase was this, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And I have to tell you, I look around in this world today and I see a lot of people who are living their life literally by what we call in the aviation world, they're flying by the seat of their pants. They literally are. In, in other words, they're not focused on their goals. They just kind of take each day as the day comes, hoping that things will work out. But to prepare your heart, you need to escape the busy life and spend some time looking inward. Just like a farmer prepares the ground, the soil, for planting the seed, so we need to prepare our hearts to hear from God. We need to get alone. We need to, to get away by ourselves just for a little while. And we need to ask God to calm our spirit. We need to get to a place where we're not distracted by the things of this world the things that will cause our attention to be diverted. And we just need to focus on becoming quiet and calm. A lot of us are afraid of silence. It makes us nervous. I happen to be one of those people. When I'm, even when I'm preparing a sermon, I usually have quiet music going. But I've discovered that if we get alone with God, spend some time just being quiet, it's amazing what God can do in our lives. Jesus had this habit. Jesus got up early in the morning before the rest of the world was stirring, and he would go out to a place where he would not be disturbed. He would spend time with God. But many of us can't stand silence. You get nervous, aren't you? You see what I mean? Just be quiet. Just get up. Prepare your heart. That's the first point. Number two is discover your word by looking up. Once you've prepared your heart, you're now ready to receive your word. Hear what I said. You need to receive it. I didn't say come up with your word. I didn't say think about your word. I said receive your word. You don't have to 
chase after it or get stressed out trying to choose it. After you've prepared your heart, simply look up to God to give you your word. Your word will be different than others because it's based on where you are in your life and where God wants to guide you. <clears throat> so listen up for God to reveal your word to you. This, of course, means that you've got to spend time in prayer. And during your prayer time, this is what you need to do. You need to ask God to take control. This takes courage because what it does is it pushes us out of our comfort zone. We are fiercely independent. We want to be in charge of our lives. We want to be in control of our circumstances and our situations. We need to acknowledge that God ultimately is in control. Amen. That God ultimately is in charge. So during your prayer time, ask God to take control. In order for you to do that, you've got to do what we did when we changed controls in the aircraft. We've got to let go. Two people can't fly an airplane. Only one at a time can do it. This phrase, I don't know where it came from, God is my co-pilot. If you've got that on your car, you need to take it off. I don't, I don't want God to be my co-pilot because that, that indicates that I'm in charge. I want God to be the pilot. I'll settle for being a co-pilot. So let, tell God to take charge of your life. It's a scary thing. I understand it. Letting go means that you're relinquishing your control over circumstances and situations. And it pushes us out of our comfort zone. But if you do that, then you need to do this. Ask God to reveal your word by asking him, what do you want to do in me? And what do you want to do through me. Remember, it's about receiving a word that's meant for you and you alone, and it's meant for you to live and to share this word with others. It's not simply a good word, but it's God's word for you. And once you have that word, then you need to live your word out. You live your word by looking out. <clears throat> that's step three. <clears throat> Live your word by looking out. When your word comes to you, it may come in the form of a character trait or a discipline. It may come in the form of a person, a focus, an attribute, or a value. But once you discover your word, you need to begin to live it out. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where life change begins to happen in your life and in my life. This isn't like a New Year's resolution like they mentioned in the video. Most people have given up their New Year's resolutions before the end of January. This is about one word that you can focus on with laser bleed. I said that every time. Laser beam clarity. Laser beam clarity that you can focus on that will drive you for the next 12 months. It's a little more challenging because you're going to be stretched by the results. But listen, it will be worth it, I promise you. You need to write the word down, and then you need to place it in conspicuous places where you'll see it every single day, several times a day. So what is the one word that will be your word for the next 12 months? You don't have to come up with it today. I want you to take this process and go do it. Today is Sacrificial Giving Sunday. Joe mentioned that. We put it out at the beginning of the year. At the end of every quarter, January, February, March, April, May, June, the end of June, July, August, September, the end of September, and the end of December, we're going to receive this Sacrificial Giving Offering. Why am I mentioning that in the middle of this discussion about the one word? Let me tell you why I mention that. Because I believe that if you, have, if you have clarity about where God wants you to go, if you have clarity of mind about what it is that God wants you to do by selecting one word that defines that for you, then you will be driven to do what God has called you to do, what God has created you to be, who God has created you to be, 
And because of that, then God will provide for you the resources that you need in order to be able to do all that God wants you to do. Listen, God gave to our leadership this, this he revealed this to us as the goal for this church. Is that, and that's it, faithful living and sacrificial giving is our goal for this year, for this church. That isn't just for the leadership of this church. That's for every member of the church. As the leadership of the church, it's our goal, to, it's our job, it's our responsibility to go to the Lord and seek His face and then come and tell you what God has told us, what God has revealed to us for His church. And this is what He gave us. Oak Grove is a hard place to do ministry. It is a hard place to do ministry. Look around. There are some empty seats in here. There are more empty seats than there are seats that are filled. But do you know what? There are 85% of this community doesn't go to church anywhere. 85%. Now, the last time I checked, there were about 11,000 residents 11,000 residents just in Oak Grove proper. That's not counting North Clarksville, Fort Campbell, Hopkinsville. Just Oak Grove, 11,000 residents. Somebody that's really good with math, tell me how many people 85% represents. Around 9,000 people. There are 9,000 people right across the street or right up the street from this church who don't go to church anywhere, who spend their day on Sunday and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday doing what they want to do because they're living their lives for themselves. And we come in here every Sunday morning and we worship God, we give God praise, we give God glory, but He has told us that we are to be His disciples, we're to be His witnesses right here in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Oak Grove is our Jerusalem, and Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And we go out of these doors, and we never open our mouth to share the good news of Christ. We never invite anybody to come in. Our neighbors are going to hell in a handbasket, and we don't ever say anything to them because we're afraid we might make them feel uncomfortable. We might alienate them. Well, you know what? They're alienated already from God. God said that they are dead in their trespasses and sin. And so I'm challenging you today as on this day that we call sacrificial giving to give more than just your money. God wants you to give your money and, and He wants you to do that sacrificially. But more than that, I believe God wants you to give of yourself sacrificially. That means you're going to have to step out of your comfort zone. You're going to have to become uncomfortable, and you might make somebody else feel uncomfortable in the process. But if we do that, God will bring these people in, and they will hear the truth, and they will come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, just like you have, and they will be part of the kingdom of God, and God's work and God's will will be strengthened and encouraged, and the kingdom of God will grow exponentially when we do that. So I don't know what your word is. I don't know what the word that God's going to give you, but maybe it's compassion. Maybe the word that you need is compassion. You see, compassion is a word that drives us to make a difference. Compassion is the thing that drives us to make a difference in the world. That was the case for the church in Thessalonica. The Apostle Paul writes this in 1 Thessalonians 3, 7 to nine, he says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live since we are standing firmly in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? When was the last time somebody said something like that about you? When was the last time somebody said, I thank my God that you came into my life, that you made a difference in my life. Brothers and sisters, that's what God has called us to do, to, to be salt and light. We talked about that a few weeks ago, to make a difference in the world. It isn't just to come here and sit on our keisters 
and then walk out of here feeling good, feeling better about myself, and then going home and eating lunch and forgetting all about what God has called us to do. It's about living our lives every day as if this were the last day. It's living our lives every day as if this were the last day. So maybe compassion is your word that God wants you to live this year. Maybe it's thankfulness. Maybe it's thankfulness. That's a word that acknowledges God's faithfulness. Thankfulness is a word that reminds us that God is great and God is good and God is faithful in every circumstance. When we fail to give thanks, what that says is that we don't acknowledge God's faithfulness in our lives. There's a story in the Bible about ten lepers, people who were, who were afflicted with this terrible skin disease where their, where their flesh literally eats away from their body. And they were out away from the people because they were unclean. And Jesus is walking by and as He's walking by they cry out and they said, Master, have mercy on us. And Jesus spoke to them and they were healed. And nine of them went away. All ten of them went away. But one of them came back to say thank you. Only one. Is that the standard? 10% are thankful? I think we need to up that standard. Because I tell you, if we don't acknowledge God's faithfulness, then we're not going to receive God's blessing. We need to acknowledge from whose hand every good and perfect gift flows. It's important that we do that. We need to acknowledge God's generosity. This is a word that describes a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, 9, 7 tells us, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Are you thankful? When I go to a restaurant, if I get really good service, I'm grateful and I show my appreciation to that waiter or waitress. Are you really thankful? Do you show God that in a real way? In a genuine, sincere way when you give money in the offering place? Maybe your word is steward. Steward. That's a word that reminds us of who owns everything. When you are the manager of somebody else's resources, you're not the owner, but you're accountable to the owner. Now, <coughs> I have mentioned to you before that I worked in the prison at Fort Leavenworth. I went to Fort Leavenworth to be the resources manager for the installation chaplain's office. And I only got to do that job about four months when I had to go into the prison to replace a chaplain, a female chaplain who had become pregnant and could no longer work with inmates. I mentioned this story to you recently. And so I left my job as resources manager to go into the prison and I was there for 18 months working with inmates. I will tell you that that, that is probably the best thing that I could recommend to anybody who's going to manage funds, to manage finances, is go spend 18 months working in a jail before you start managing funds. Because when you do, you'll appreciate the fact that if you mess up, because this isn't your money, it's somebody else's money, that if you mess up, the results could be prison. And I went there to work, and I didn't want to go there to live. But I say this because I think it's important. We see the, our possessions as our own. We see our possessions as these things belong to me. That's my car. That's my house. That's my television set. That's, you name it, fill in the blank. But you put the word mine in front of it. It's mine. You sound like those seagulls in Finding Nemo. Mine, 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 mine. But listen, we are not owners. We are simply stewards of the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. 
Second Chronicles 29, 11 through 12 reminds us of this fact. It says, yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. You see, everything belongs to God. Everything comes from God. And everything is distributed by God. Just because something is in your possession doesn't mean that it is your possession. There are opportunities all around us to be good stewards all the time. You can invest your time. You can invest your words. You can invest by tithing. You can invest in others by loving them. But strategic stewardship opportunities only arrive occasionally. Our sacrificial giving offering that we will receive at the end of the service is just such an opportunity. It is a strategic giving opportunity, a strategic stewardship opportunity, because you're investing in the thing that this church does to reach the people of this community with the gospel of Christ. And you know what those are. We're reaching out in this community all the time. In just a few weeks, we're going to have, in just a couple of weeks, weekends from now, we're going to have our community-wide Easter egg hunt. You said, what's a community-wide Easter egg hunt got to do with, with sharing the good news of Christ? It's reaching out to people and meeting their needs. That's what it is. And in, in, in less than a month, or a little more than a month from now, we're going to have our community-wide block party event where we, where we give away everything. We give away food, we give away snow cones, we give away popcorn, we give away door prizes galore. <coughs> what has that got to do with sharing the gospel? <coughs> it's letting people know. Listen, recently I got contacted by an inmate. Did I tell this story already? I don't think so. Recently I got contacted. I forget. I tell so many stories. I don't mean lie. I mean, <laughs> let me phrase that. <laughs> Can we edit that on the video? <laughs> I forget when and where I've, I've told these stories, but recently I was contacted by an inmate at the Christian County Jail who was looking for some help. He was looking for a church who might help him. His wife is not here. She lives in Missouri. She has spina bifida and is confined to a wheelchair and has to live with her mother because her husband, who was her caregiver and her breadwinner, is now in jail. And so she's living in Missouri and cannot help him. And he didn't have any funds. He didn't have any resources, and he needed basic stuff, underwear, t-shirts, socks. And he reached out to me. And so I went to visit him before I gave him these items. I went and purchased these items and gave it to him. And I asked him how he got my number, how he got the church's number. And he said that another inmate in jail had some folks that were visiting him and he had shared this with this inmate. And the people told his friend, the in other inmate, call Living Waters Fellowship because that's the church in Oak Grove that is a giving church. Amen. Okay? Listen, our reputation as being a given church, giving church is known in this community. That means that some people come and take advantage of us. Is that true, Margo? Sometimes they do. Sometimes they come and they take advantage. They drive up in their brand new car and they come in and get food from Elisha's closet. But sometimes there's a genuine need. And we don't distinguish. We don't say, no, you, you're driving a new car. You can't have any of our food. We give. As God provides, we give. And God has continued to bless that ministry because of that. What I'm saying is, is that we are known in this community as a giving church. That Easter egg hunt and that block party, the vacation Bible school that we will do here this summer. All of the things that our church is involved in tell this community that we love you because Christ first loved us. And these things are resourced by this sacrificial giving offering. That's how we're going to pay for the Easter egg hunt. That's how we're going to pay for the block party. That's how we're going to purchase the supplies and things that we need for vacation Bible school. And we could go on and on and on. We're going to have a women's 
uh, uh, women's spring women's conference this coming Saturday here at the church. And, and the resources that we need in order to carry out these things to reach out to this community come through the sacrificial giving. You say, well, Pastor, what about the stuff that goes in the offering plate? What is that all about? The lights are on, aren't they? The lights, <laughs> the heat, the water, the coffee, the mortgage. Thank you, Brother Joe. That's how we pay for those. Salaries, a little. That's how we pay for those, what you give every week. That's how we pay for those things. But the sacrificial giving is all of the other things that we're doing to reach out to this community in a very real way. As a church, that's how we're going to underwrite those things. And if you don't give, guess what? We don't get to, to give away. And you say, well, I don't want to give my money if you're just going to give it away. No, you don't understand. What did Jesus do before he ever proclaimed the truth? He met needs. He met needs. If people needed to be healed, he healed them. If people were hungry, he would provide food for them. And then he would proclaim the truth. Listen, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Maybe your word is courage. Courage moves us to do the right thing, even if it is the hard thing. And for some of you, maybe that needs to be your word this year, because you are so afraid that somebody might find out that you're a Christian, that you hide it effectively. Because you're afraid they might ask you a question that you don't have the answer to, or something else. Listen, courage may be the word that you need to choose for this year. Because it means doing the right thing, even if, it's, even if the right thing is the hard thing. Maybe your word is intentional. Intentional is a word that keeps us from missing opportunities. Last week, I was listening. I was in the sound booth, but I was listening to Dave Ramsey during Financial Peace. And he said this. He said, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. That's right. We need to be intentional about what we do. Maybe your word needs to be intentional. Maybe you've got, you've got some great ideas and you intended to do it, but you just never got around to it. That means you lack intentionality. Maybe your word needs to be intentional. Maybe your word needs to be obedience. It is a word that reminds us to follow God's will in every area of our lives. Every area of our lives. In our families. In our work relationships. In our finances. It's being obedient to God. Finally, I would ask you to pray this prayer. After you've chosen your word and you've figured out how you're going to put that word into action in your life, I would ask you to pray this prayer. Lord, what do you want to do through our family, through me and through my family, to accomplish your goals for the work of the kingdom and for the work of this church? Because until we have turned the reins over to the one who rightly owns everything, until we've turned control over to the one who has given us everything that we have, we're never going to hear the words that the Apostle Paul so eloquently penned that he wanted to hear when he got to heaven. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Servant, enter into your reward. What is your word? That's the question. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for this message today. I thank you, Lord, that you have given to us clearly a path that we can follow to discover your work, your work and your will, and how we can be involved in